Hey everyone, welcome to Coffee with Kelly week 130. I'm so excited that you're joining me today and I thank you for it. Hey, while I'm thinking about it, uh, the book of James is on my mind. I told you last week that I've been uh, writing it for our latest to start. So if you're local and you wanna join us in our study, it's a six week study on James and it starts next week, uh, which is the first week in October. You can go to uh, calvarymarietta.com and look on the women's page and see all the info on it if you'd like. So if you're local, come on, enjoy us. Uh, the study guides will be online as well if you're just looking for a study of James to do yourself. So our topic this morning is called birds of a feather flock together, which is why I grabbed this cup. It says friend, laughter, fun, and lasting love. Then it talks about a friend loves at all times from Proverbs um, because we're going to be talking th about that for a little bit. So let's pray. Father, we do come before you this afternoon, Lord, and I thank you for your word. I thank you that um, it challenges us and encourages us and edifies us, yet, yet it convicts us at the same time. And so I pray, God, that we uh, would really listen this morning with open hearts, open ears, and open mind to what your spirit wants to tell us this afternoon about this topic. And so we just give you the next few minutes in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I said, birds of a feather flock together. So just yesterday, I was at the vet with my wonderful inherited dog. And um, this dog is very needy. I've told you that before. Or if you know us, you know that. It gets shots every month uh, for a, a skin thing it has. He's on thyroid meds. He's got all kinds of things all the time. So I feel like I'm always at the vet. So thank you, my daughter, McCall. So anyways, I was at the vet and waiting, you know, for my turn and this lady comes in and she has a dog and she goes to another vet but i don't think she was happy with that vet so she was looking for you know what kind of things that this vet office offer do they have packages do they have oncology because obviously her dog her little dog had cancer and so they were just having this whole conversation back and forth and it's just me and my dog in the waiting room so we're actually listening because we have nothing else to do uh we as in like he's listening so we're sitting there listening and then when she's done talking i'd really like him to come here and try you out she goes to leave and then she turns around and says do you want to see a picture of my baby and the two receptionists are all yes we want to see it and i kind of wanted to get up and go see it and and so as this was all happening i started to chuckle because oftentimes if i'm with a bunch of grand uh, grandparents we're like that about showing our pictures oh look at my grand kid what he's doing or what she's doing now and you know i was told early on if someone doesn't have grandkids they don't want to see your grandkids you got to wait to be in the grandkid club and then they want to see your pictures but anyways i was chuckling about this camaraderie that um these people had in the vet kind of like i thought of birds of a feather right we all have this common love for animals which is why we're all in there maybe you don't like animals and you're just visit the vet when you have to but most of us in the vet's office really have this love for animals and it's this common thread this common bond that we have like i mentioned the kind of the grandparent thing and um as humans birds of a feather do like to flock together right and that phrase is an old english proverb that just means that typically human beings of the similar interest or type or personality or other distinctive distinctive attributes like to hang out together now, the Urban Dictionary, which I do not recommend people to look at, but I happen to look at it for this, it simply says, birds of a feather is an expression that means peeps with similar likes, appearances, or behaviors hanging together. You know, it has nothing to do with jealousy or cliques or you shouldn't have so many friends. It wasn't any negative connotation at all. It simply means when people act the same, look the same, like the same things, they generally like to hang out kind of human nature. If you have a group of runners, we like to hang out together. We talk the same talk. You know, we like the same things that, oh, have you ran that race? Have you ran that race? You have that with bikers or people who sew or people who like to make bread, you know, whatever it is, you have that commonality between you. And so it's fun to talk about. You know, we typically like people with similar tastes and interests, right? It's we like being around those people. Um, it's comfortable. 
It's just comfortable. Now, as believers, though, we tend to do the same, right? We have this common thread of Jesus Christ that bonds us together. It's like the strong bond our faith brings us. You can be in another country singing worship together, same music, different words. We can't understand each other, but your hearts are knit together because you know you're worshiping the same God. And so that is so cool, this common bond. I mean, we are family. We are in the family of God and we are brothers and sisters in Christ. Often, though, I think we can take that too far, if you will. We tend to stay in our little bubble, our Christian bubble, where we're comfortable, where we have the same convictions, and we think the same thing, the same view, the same perspectives, and we get really comfortable there in a place where our faith isn't challenged or threatened many times. But I'm going to poke that bear for just a minute, because is that what God has called us to do? To stay with the similar, to stay with believers, to stay comfortable? I don't think so. Now, don't get me wrong, and I can be just as guilty as everyone else. I like comfortable. I like to be comfortable. I don't like feeling uncomfortable. But we are called to be salt and light in this world. And honestly, that phrase, salt and light, screams uncomfortable to me. Doesn't it to you? To be a light in the darkness, in some context or some level of being different in that phrase or just being uncomfortable because we're going against the evils and darkness of the world. To be a light in this world, we can't take ourselves out of the darkness, we have to be in the uncomfortableness of the darkness to shine and be a light in the world. Removing ourselves from the world so it doesn't stain us, as I hear lately people say, that's actually the opposite of what we're called to do. Like go away in a ministry and work on your personal holiness and practice all the spiritual disciplines then you can. And like we're going to achieve some nirvana or something, you know, by doing that. That's not what we're supposed to do with our faith. We are supposed to protect ourselves in from the stain of the world in a sense, but we're supposed to enter the darkness armed with the full armor of God and, you know, poke holes in the darkness. We go in prepared and ready and to light it up. That's what we're called to do. Like the early uh, church, it says they turn their world upside down. It says that in Acts 17, 6. Now, I'm not saying to stop hanging around believers and never do that. Not at all. There are family, but don't hang out just with believers. Get out there into the darkness. Get out there. Be a light at work. Be a light in your neighborhood. Be a light in your community. Get out there and shine and poke holes in the darkness. We're told to be bridge builders, right? And to bridge uh, dark and light so that we can share our faith in that way, help break down walls and build connections to further the gospel. Those who are different than us, to those who have different convictions, are different religions, have different likes. You know, we don't build bridges with people in our own family to, uh, you know, but we build bridges with those outside of the faith to help, again, connect them to Christ and get them down the right path. You know, like I said in the beginning, I'm writing James chapter 2, and James is all about that true and genuine faith produces works. And if not, it's a dead faith or it's useless. If it doesn't point others to Christ and glorify the Father, what good is it? I pray that you're not one who says, hey, that re- my religion is, um, it's a private matter to me. I don't want to talk about it to me. That's just between me and God and, and it's nobody else's business. I would dare tell you that the writer of the book of James, which is James, Jesus' half-brother, he would have issue with that. And you can take that up with him. But because he talks about what a true faith looks like, read James chapter 2. Uh, If there's no point to our faith and sharing it with others, it can be useless. Now, we all know we're called to evangelize. Maybe we're not called to be evangelists, but we are all called to evangelize. Who are we evangelizing if we stay within the church walls and stay within our own family? We are called to evangelize those who don't know Jesus. Who are we telling the gospel if we never get out there? 
kids on a sports team or our neighborhood get togethers or our church, I mean, our work parties or whatever they are. Now we need to find our individual balance between flocking together and mixing with the multitude because that with uh, the body of Christ is where you find your encouragement and your love and they build each other up and so many verses about that. But we have to be outside of the faith to do a lot of things the scripture tells us which number one is to get out into the world and share the good news of Jesus Christ. Um, Don't shy away from them. Don't be afraid to mix with them. Their doctrines and their theology or their morals and perspectives don't have to change yours. You know the truth. You hold on to the truth and see how God would use you to poke holes in their falsities with the truth that you know. Don't think politics is going to bring light to the darkness. Don't think government or having a Christian nation is going to poke holes in the darkness. The world will always be about sin. It it will. And after sin, that's why this world is destroyed in the end. And a new one is made and going to be created because uh, read the end of the book. We are not going to become this nation that where we are all Christians. Um, You be a Christian in your nation. You be a Christian at your work. You be a Christian that will shine and light up the darkness in wherever you go. You know, the laws that are made are always going to reflect the direction a nation is going. And I'm not telling you not to buck against that. that. That's not what I'm saying. So, but please hear me. I'm telling you to keep first things first. Um, Brian talked about the verse this Sunday, seek ye first the kingdom of God. That's first. That's what will turn our world upside down. And his name is Jesus. So yes, birds of a feather flock together, enjoy each other, but also mix with the mixed multitude of the world and bring the joy and love of Christ to those who are dying. Shine and light up this darkness with Jesus Christ. God bless you guys. Let's pray. Father, we do come before you and I thank you, Lord, again for your word. And I thank you that you were the light of the world and that now you dwell within us, these earthen vessels, so that we may now bring light to the darkness of this world as well. Lord, I pray that you would use us in a great way, that we would um, get out of our comfort zones We would get out of just staying with the birds in our flock and flock together and get out into the world and be a light in the darkness. Show us the balance and show us how to do that and give us the boldness to be lights for you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys.